and kept us to enjoy fellowship over his word. Thank you for being part of the family of the Believer's Faith Embassy, especially on our broadcast on Facebook and also on radio. I thank God for his goodness and his mercy. I want us to lift up our voices to him and give him praise, glorify his name. Thank him for the gift of life and salvation in the Holy Spirit and fellowship and the brethren and all that he has put together for us. This moment, I believe, God, that we are all settled in his presence in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you this moment. We give you praise and glory and honor. We celebrate your faithfulness in your mercy. That I knew this morning, thank you for forgiving our iniquities and the days of our life. And even today, we come boldly with identity as sons in your kingdom. The Lord, our Father in heaven, let your mercy prevail for me as an individual, for my wife, O God, for my children and my mother, my siblings, our Father, and every member of the family of God on the earth, especially believers with embassy. And I pray that each one of us, O God, finds mercy in your sight so that there's no judgment, but mercy, and mercy of God that connects us back to the grace of heaven. And may your, may your grace increase upon our life, giving us strength to overcome every sin and way that easily beset us, our Father. And we may be counted, we may be counted as worthy of the journey to heaven and making it our Father in Jesus' precious name. To you alone be the praise, the glory, now and always in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Beloved, I'm glad this morning to let you know that God will go before you in the name of Jesus Christ and make your path straight. You will settle every month of your life. You know, this is our week of divine settlement. What does it mean to have a divine settlement? It simply means, okay, verse 3 and 4, the voice of him that cried in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway for our God. And for every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. That's the word means to have divine settlement. Every valley in your life, weak points, weakness, lack, want, you know, struggles, be settled, be filled up with whatever you need require by the bless of God. Meaning God will satisfy you with his goodness. And also the Bible says the mountain shall be leveled and the hill shall be brought low. Whatever is a resistance, obstacle, hindering your progress and success in life, God is committed to level them, to bring them down. Whatever is crooked, God says he is going to make it straight. Praise be to God. And that is what we want to lift up our voice and say, Father, in Jesus' name, this week of divine settlement, settle every matter of concern in my life in the name of Jesus Christ. Bring down every mountain, exalt every valley, Make straight whatever is crooked in my life, and whatever is not plain, which is this rough, my Father. Make it straight and blessed and plain in the name of Jesus Christ. Shall we lift up our voices to God this morning and pray that prayer in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray this day by the greatness of your power and your love. Let it be that every matter that is hindering our success, our breakthrough, our promotion, our lifting, our growth, increase, and establishment, be leveled, be removed, be disengaged, be destroyed in the name of Jesus Christ. In every matter, God, that is low, lacking and want in our lives, it looks like a valley or a depression in our life and oppression of the enemy. We pray this moment in the name of Jesus Christ. Fill it up with every supply, with every single need, without any pressure in our lives in Jesus' name. Let this be settled without pressure. Let healing flow like a river. Let your grace be sufficient for all our needs in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Whatever is wrong, O oh God, the sin that easily beset us, the weight that is over our lives, my Father, our God, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord Almighty, we break the forces of hell. Whatever is out of the way, let it be the way, my Father. Bring everything to order, that is out of order in our lives, in the name of Jesus Christ. Miracle worker, Holy Ghost of glory. We pray this morning, our Father, you shall send help on time. You shall release your grace upon our lives. In the precious name of Jesus, mighty and everlasting Father, let it be this day we shall experience a visitation in every area of our lives that will settle every matter of concern in Jesus' name. And as we pray, we have believed. And I know by faith in the name of Jesus, your case is settled because of God's faithfulness. And the word of God says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain, every, each, all of them put together, shall and he shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight 
and the rough places play in the name of Jesus Christ. Enjoy divine settlement over that long standing case of your life in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And we get then to our next level on the teaching that we had yesterday about setting the record straight on followership. We have a series of teachings on this and we are going on followership and others. Now let us go to the second part of this teaching about setting the record straight. You know, there are many misconceptions about followership and we will try to put together by the help of the Holy Spirit the right spiritual, scriptural perspective of followership. And we are put together saying, yes, that somebody is available in a church, in the presence of God, a man of God, does not make them true followers because followership has its own results. Followership, Jesus said, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Only followers are made, not those who are available, that you avail yourself on time in church. Does not mean the blessing of the day will come to you, except your follower. Praise be to God. So followership is not for those who are available only. Followership is not human worship. You see, people like Elisha will be calling, uh, honoring Elijah so, so powerfully. And then you'll be asking yourself, is it worship? Why are they talking us, telling us to worship? We'll be talking about uh, uh, setting the record straight on leadership so that we can also see what is the right leadership and what is the wrong one and what the Bible says for the same. Because there are also leaders who are doing the right thing and leaders who are doing it wrongly. We are people also following the right way and those who are following it in the wrong way. So we are saying, let us get the, spirit, the, the scriptural perspective. The Bible says for followership is our interest and concern. And we are saying, see, if that somebody came around a church, a grace, it's not that he is a follower. Because the results will tell us whether he follows. Followership ends or is maximized at the point of inheriting the promises of God. It's a manifestation of the or duplication of grace. You can say, when they ask them in the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Yes, and they followed him in chapter Luke chapter 22, verse 28. He says, you are the ones endure with who have endure with me in my temptation, and I appoint you a kingdom. I reward you. I give an inheritance. I give you this particular blessing for you are committed, successful followership. And then we begin to see them in the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. They see, they now began to manifest the very things that were transferred, that were imparted, that they followed and they were rewarded with. Bible says in the book of Hebrews 6, 12, he says, do not be lazy, but be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So at the day end of genuine followership, there is inheritance of the promises of God. And that's what the Bible puts it so well in the book of Acts, chapter 22 and verse 35. It should be 32. It says, 20, sorry, Acts 20 and verse 32. He says, Brethren, I commend you to God. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. When you set your life to be sanctified, to live separated from the world system, and you are committed to follow the promise of God, you receive an inheritance or inheritances. Inheritances are many things in put together. The inheritance that Christ has put together, the inheritance of eternal life, inheritance of good health, and inheritance of prosperity, inheritance of, of, of and you should remember what we talked about yesterday, the sevenfold inheritances that we find in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 5 in verse number 12. The Bible talks about the inheritance of riches, the inheritance of power, the inheritance of strength, the inheritance of wisdom, the inheritance of glory, the inheritance of honor, and the inheritance of blessing. Hallelujah. Those are heritage, sevenfold heritage, that Christ delivered to us by his death and his resurrection. We are not just enlisted to, to become citizens of heaven and we struggle and suffer on the earth. And when the time is up, we go to go to heaven and see God forever. No, thank God for that is the ultimate and that is the right thing. But we are saying it's a package with this kind of thing that can be, are still meant to be manifest on the earth. For example, it says in the same Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, it says, And Jesus has made us priests and kings unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth, not just in heaven. And so we need to understand what is it, how to maximize priesthood, how to maximize kingship, 
that brings us into the realm of dominion on the face of the earth. Remember, the original purpose and plan of God for mankind was that they may walk in dominion. Hallelujah. They may walk in dominion on the face of the earth. But the Bible says, uh, uh, let them have dominion. And Jesus made us priests and kings to make details and define us in the current and latest status that God has given his church in the last days. And therefore, you must understand and be in that position, therefore, to walk in dominion or to reign on the face of the earth. Either. We, we must make that trip. You see, God has in himself invested his grace, his power, in certain specific blessings in vessels. Vessels of human beings that have all kinds of limitations and frustrations and all manner. Well, for example, Jesus was not a weak, he didn't have any human weakness in terms of sin, but he's limited. If he has to go from Capernaum to Galilee, he has to walk or use a donkey. You see? And so, in, uh, uh, for us, with all one of weaknesses, Noah is a drunkard. David with ladies is something else. Solomon, the same matter. People like, um, um, I mean, uh, King Saul, we have other issues all together. But we are saying, see, that there was honor that God, I mean, David would honor the, uh, King Saul was not that he worshipped him. That Elisha would worship uh, and prostrate before 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 uh, um, Elijah does not make him a uh, 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 god to him. That the man who came forth to Jesus, thank God he was God and he was to be worshipped. But at that time, Jesus was seen as a prophet, as a servant of God. The, the Samaritan that came and bowed before him and did this was honoring the grace that brought healing upon his life. So when we talk about our spiritual fathers and how we respect them. How we honor them is different from saying this is human worship. No, we worship God, but we honor vessels that carry the grace. Because until the vessel is honored, the grace does not flow. Jesus has proved it in his uh, visit at his own village, in his own home backyard, and does it. He's so clear, Mark chapter 6, verse 1 5. Say, a prophet is not without honor except his country and in his own home and house. Why? Because and what happened? By so doing, the Bible says, he laid hands on a few folks and healed them and marveled at their belief. He could not believe himself. You mean people can have and believe this much? And the Bible says they were offended at him. You cannot honor somebody that you're offended in. And because of that dishonor, disrespect, they were disconnected from the flow of the healing virtue we see in Capernaum and other parts of the land. And we are saying, Therefore, it is wisdom uh, to, for you to honor the vessel, the carne, in the book of Matthew 10, 41. The Bible says, Whosoever receiveth a prophet shall receive the blessing of a prophet. So if you don't receive, if you don't honor, if you ignore them, if you assume, if you carry them along like anybody else, the story, the, the effect is you will not enjoy the grace that flows. So there's the element of honoring the vessel that connects you with the cast, the cast, the grace that the fellow is a custodian of. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Yes, we are saying coming to church always doesn't make it follow. Many people come to church and they just, you know, their, their mind is not separate. Don't stay with their agenda. They come to church and their mind is in Italy, Japan, wherever they are, their mind will go. But you see, we are saying coming to, uh, following, you know, has a lot of things to do with it. Number one, do you know who you are following? Number two, do you know how to follow? And number three, do you identify the grace available in God whom you are following or in the vessel that you are following? And are you sensitive and committed to get these things happening in your life? And so, is everyone able to do a, a, a bit of that introduction? And I'm just uh, uh, helping us to get to the same path, uh, path that we may have this thing put together. Identify the grace available. Identify the hand kind of thing that happens. So, we are available for us. Let us briefly this particular moment again look at the qualities of a good, successful, effective follower. What are the qualities of, of good and successful followers? I would want to summarize it in the book of, uh, from the book of uh, Matthew, I mean, I mean uh, 2 Timothy and chapter 2 Timothy chapter in chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says like this, every scripture is God breath, and the Bible says so, given by his inspiration and his prophet. 
scripture is profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. Look at what the Bible says in King James Version. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A, a, the qualities of a follower who will succeed are embedded in those four aspects of scriptural verses. One, that you must be willing and ready to be taught. You are teachable. I what to call a teachable spirit. That calls for humility in itself. Bible says, uh, learn from me for I make and load your heart, and you shall receive a rest for your souls. You must be ready to be rebuked. We have said this several times. One of the spiritual blessings that come with accepting rebuke or reproof is that it opens you up to be filled or to receive the Holy Spirit and to receive revelation. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. My son, pay attention to my, accept my reproof. So will I pour my spirit upon you and I will reveal my words to you. So when you resist rebuke, when you have missed it in life, then you have blocked the spirit of God to bring revelation to your life and to fill you and to guide you. Praise God. It shows you are not humble. You know, when you are teachable, we say you are humble. In that teachability or in humility, you are then correctable at the same time. And there's correction that you are going to rebuke, say, hey, it's, it's, stop it. Don't do that. That is what every other child will do. Maybe you are, you, you look at it like children in a class, in a class setup. And, and, and they are talking about, you know, we were, what, we, you, last weekend, we went for the birthday, blah, 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 blah. And they just say, shh, you keep, guys keep quiet. And then, and then they keep up their time, and, and they think they are smart. And then when they start checking again back at the, maybe there's something on the board, they come back and say, you know something? My auntie also said next weekend, we are going for another party. You know how this is a holiday, we are doing a lot of party business. Shh, stop it! As good students will not be angry. They know they made it mis made mistake because they are distracting. There are things they cannot explain at that time. That's the essence of rebuke. Rebuke is like stopping from getting it, going down the drain of destruction. And so you must be stopped. It's not the same as correction. You must be stopped. You are distracted from class. Our time is 40 minutes. You are here. We can't go into explanation. So we say, stop it. I don't want to hear any noise in this class. That is rebuke. Some of you are not serious. Stop it. Stop what you're doing. That is what? Rebuke. Correction is, well, one plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Four plus three. You are cram that they always ask one plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. Today they ask you one plus one, you say two. Two plus two, you ask four. And three plus uh, four, you say eight. Because you are, you are like, you are, you are getting it in a particular pattern that you have already crammed. 4 plus 4 is 16, 3 plus 6 is 32, 2 plus 3 is 64, 7 plus 4 is 1 to 3. You, 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 that's a pattern you have crammed. It takes patience to learn. And just imagine in a Kenya setup, a child step from class 1 to class 8, doing similar things, so to speak. They are partly growing, they are partly being socialized, and then they are getting now information that they cannot even use to go and work, for example. It's just a basis, a foundation. Then they go from form one to form four. Again, there is still similar to things, and they bring now from uh, finalizing that thing. That is the, a person with that attitude or ability or grace is one who will enjoy followership. You are able to be taught. You don't have problem being rebuked. And I just said, blessed is he that is not offended in me, because it's, when you are rebuked, you are likely to be offended. And then there's element getting training. So those are the, the foundational truths. If you are going to maximize on followership, as we explained, you must be settled on the truth from the book of 2 Timothy and chapter 3, verse 16. And let's now get the details. I'll be a few later we can discuss this morning. Now, number one, he was not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body now dead. Hallelujah. Being 100 years old, near the dinners of Sarah, he did not consider. Faith is about considering. Followership 
which is an act of faith, is about not considering natural limits, satanic interferences, manifestations, threats, and lies, deception. You don't consider that. But you have got to consider what God said is superior to what, God, what the devil is doing anytime, anywhere. And so our focus must be on what did God say? What is he doing? Verse 20 says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in the faith, giving glory to God. He countered the mockery of the natural circumstances. Mama, I mean, Mama Sarah is barren. Mama Sarah has reached menopause. Abraham's old body has now not been, is not able to have it get children as it were. But he's saying, yes, there's every reason for me to doubt and to fear, into to have unbelief. But I choose what I receive from God. Look, and being fully persuaded, not partly, fully persuaded that, that he had, that what he, God, had promised, he was also able to perform. That is what gave, I mean, rise to success in the, in the life of this man. If you are going to be a successful and effective follower, you must have strong faith. We see one of the ways that makes people have strong faith is that you have an encounter with God. As you say, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And which kind of word of God are we talking about? There are two types of word of God. What is written, that we, we preach from what is written, and there is what God speaks to you directly. If you can access an encounter with God, you will find your faith is strong, very strong. Moses was such a wonder-working man. But I read that he did not hear the word of God. He heard from the mouth of God. He had an encounter with God. God to do firewood business with confidence and assurance from the throne of grace. God. And you succeed greatly. Same when you have an encounter with God or with the man of God. Your faith is energized. Is empowered to deliver at a higher level than when you hear preachings. The word of God as it were. Glory to God in the eyes. And so, you need to have a strong faith like the one Abraham had. The encounter of Elijah, hey, gave him a strong faith. And therefore, he became a successful uh, follower. And it, people like Gaz, they don't seek. They are interested about the environment. They don't care about what is available. That's why he doesn't know this ministry. It's a ministry that functions on the altar of prayer. He doesn't know. And so that is why he's limited and frustrated at the end of the day. Different spirit. What does that mean? In the book of Numbers, in chapter 40, if it were possible, you can, in your own personal, I mean, private study, you can go for, uh, for all of that particular verse, apart according to thy word. Are we together? Verse 24, rather. I mean, this is verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because in another spirit with him, he has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land where into he went, and his seed shall possess it. After the Bible says, But my servant Caleb, because there's a different spirit that has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Message Bible says, But my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he is counted. And his children will inherit it. Look at that. He has a different spirit together, together with Joshua. From the rest of the company of the spies that went to spy the land. Hallelujah. He has a different spirit from the spirit of the world. From the spirit that is carnal. Carnality is always going to bring the enemy to God. The other guys became enemies of God. Look at it. Romans chapter 8. The Bible says, To be carnally minded is enemy with God. And to be spiritually minded is life. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This explains what happens when they are just about to cross into, into, into Canada. In that, 
those who had the spirit that was what they were seeing. These are people who have seen God clear in nations before them and they left it. They are just about to inherit. But there's one wrong thing in them. They are depending on the five senses. They say they saw the inhabitants of the land while giants and themselves were like grasshoppers in the sight of the giants. What about God who says shall enter? He didn't lie to you. A different spirit is a spirit that is visionary and is loyal. You, you, it's, it's right attitude. Your loyalty makes your spirit align itself to the promise of God. Willing, ready, and never even to, be, to receive more still instruction from our God. The Bible says, and these guys say, the strength of these guys have left them. They can't, they're not our match. We are going to clear them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Look behind there. They, 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 they were... You know, we read behind here. He was so, Moses was so angry. There we call it. Look at verse 6. And Joshua the son of Canaan and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which of the, them that said the land, rent their clothes. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to such it is, he said, is it a good land? If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the, this land and give us it, 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 it us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not yet against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land. For they are brave for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. And the spirit, the different spirit. Courage, loyalty, you know, right attitude. Make up a right spirit that will give you a bit to follow. Because as we said, followership is hard. And when you are carnal, you reach a place and look at the weaknesses. Look at, you reach a place and you give up. Look at a place and look at the, the fiscal opposition. You lose focus from God's promise and God's word. And you begin to focus on things that hinder, block, and restrain. And you miss out on the eventual reward of your followership. Followership is not easy, we said yesterday. And followership requires, therefore, a man with resolute heart. Commitment, made up mind. You have not had God change his mind. So why are you changing your own mind? If they didn't say it is easy, they are going to a wilderness experience. That happens to human beings. As I said, God is glorified in good life, in good things, and challenges of life at the same time. I see, you need to understand that that is what makes the, the approval of God. Of all the first generation of guys who left Egypt, we are told only Caleb and Joshua made it, inherited the promises of God concerning the land of Canaan. Why? Because they had a different spirit. That's why in church, or wherever for are, don't you ever join people you don't even know. They are, more, they, they are backbiting, they are gossiping, they are slandering, they are walking out of the way of God. They say it's not possible. We can't pray and fast like this. We can't follow like this. We can't do this and that. When you do that, you have a common spirit. Common in murmuring. Murmuring is common everywhere. Lying is common everywhere. Committing sin is common everywhere. Fear is common everywhere. And grief is common everywhere. Explanation and excuse is common everywhere. And that is what defeats many, many Christians. They don't understand. The, the truth about followership is not easy. Jesus said, you are the ones who have endured with me in my trials. You are the one. You have stood firm. When they, when they opposed me, they also, you, you, you took part in the opposition. When they, they, talk, they talk of me, you took part in the trouble. When we went preaching for three days and nobody was eating, you two were part of the people that were not eating. You know, and by see, I'm seeing your faithfulness and your commitment. See now, this is your reward. Hallelujah. This is your reward. You must be visionary. You must be full of faith in what God has said. You must be committed, you know, to the caliber up to life. Speak on behalf of God. Stand on God's side. Don't stand on the side of the world and say, surely nobody can get married now. Nobody can get healed today. And they are made up of sending more. You, that is a, a common spirit, a failure spirit, a defeated spirit, but a victorious spirit, a winning spirit, is a different spirit, is a spirit of courage in the face of opposition. Be looking at the greatness of God against the threats of the devil through natural occurrences.
Number three, you must be spiritual. Well, it looks the same but different at the same time. You must be spiritual. You must go beyond principles. You must go beyond principles. You must go beyond principles. Basically, a different spirit works by 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 uh, by, by, by principles, basically. But we must go deep in the realm of the spirit. You must be spiritual. To be spiritual simply means you are a person who is relying, who is come under the influence of the word of God. At the same time, the Holy Spirit of God. You are, your spirituality is not measured by the looks, the loudness of yourself, the ground on your, life, on, on, on your tongue is determined by your ability to be influenced by the word of God and by the Holy Ghost of heaven. Look at the children my tomb and the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8. There's a story there about this woman who is receiving many men of God in her house. And then there's one particular one who is called I mean, Elisha. And she says to her husband, I perceive, I desire that this is a holy man of God. Let us therefore make room for him on the wall here and give him a, a table and a stool and, and, and bed it. And he, when he comes around on his way to ministry, uh, assignment place, let him rest around and be comfortable. She didn't even know what she was buying into. And she was spiritual. She was discerning. She was able to perceive in her spirit. She was not just a good Christian giving good things to people. In fact, she'd been giving and nothing much has happened. When she now did something for a special person, she is, Bible says, do good unto all men, but be special in this place. However, over and above, especially of the household of faith. This one knows that. She's been giving generally to all Christians that come through her house, but she has a special grace and gift for this special man of God with the grace he carries. And she didn't even know she was tapping into the anointing and the empowerment and the grace on the man of God. And that brought about change in her life. And she was not only this, she's not just a recipient of a miracle child, she's a strong follower of the man of God. As I say, when you have impact, when you have an encounter with the grace, your faith is very strong. See, the child dies. She doesn't bother telling her husband. The husband is one kind of a man who has no spiritual antenna. He doesn't pick signals. Neither does he hear from God. He's just a good because he's not bad. That kind of man. Good because he's not bad. He accepts that the, man, the woman can you know, build a house for the man of God. That is good enough. And then that, his spiritual sense is, is low, is sleepy, is floppy. You know, and that is why you find that. When the child was sick, he believed the wife would be more spiritual than him. So he says, send the boy to the mother. They took the child to the mother. The mother put the child in the, in the a pastor, a, 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 a prophet's house. The child was there for some time. The child then passed off, died. And the woman, because of her conviction, her spirituality, she believes the answer lies with the man of God. So she tells her workers to carry the child to the man of God, wherever he was. And as they went, oh yes, uh, Elisha is asking the Gehazi. I see the, the kind of driving that is coming on the horses. Is for this children my woman. What is it that will be with her? And then she, he said, she asked, go and ask her. Is it well with the husband, with their child? She goes, say, husband, okay, child is fine. So come here. So what is it? She went and went, got hold of the feet of Elisha and cried before the Lord in his presence. And when Elisha had what happened, he says, oh, uh, Gehazi, who doesn't do much? He is also spiritually dead. A man has no clue of how to use the mantle of the man of God to bring about a miracle healing. He's not like Elisha, who has a hand and a task to manifest the very grace that was upon Elisha. Elisha, uh, Gehazi is like the, the husband, the children of my tumor. No spiritual sense, just present, just available, just coming to church, just around the man of God, just doing good only, without any spiritual sensitivity or, or, or spirituality for that man. What happened? Because of her followership, her spirituality, her understanding of the things of the spirit, she was rescued of that impending shame and loss of her only son. Praise God. So if you're going to be an effective follower, you must have spiritual ability to, number one, identify the grace of God. And also, wise enough to respect the vessel and the grace available. And also to know how to tap into, honor practically, 
practical respect to the grace in the house. The woman honored the servant of God by seeing what God has opened to her. And she became a stronger, better personal follower of Elisha. And see how she ended up greatly blessed. Remember later on in life, there was famine that was going to happen. And God told him, and, and, and Elisha, tells the Shunammite woman among all people, you, this thing coming, nobody will be able to stand it easily. Go into a foreign country. Go and be there. And then when it's over, you can come back. And she obeyed that statement. And she went. When she left, maybe she overstayed or whatever, but we don't know. Somebody took all her, her property. And when she came back, she found Gehazi in the chamber of the, uh, of the king. And the, the Gehazi explained, because Gehazi was trying to explain to the king, the, the impact and the exploits of Elisha. See, the woman that Elisha raised the child is even present here now. I said, what is her matter? She presented her case and her land was restored. She is a full beneficiary of following rightly by the means of being spiritual. So we cannot effectively maximize the benefit of our followership without being spiritually alive. You are able to discern. You are able to pick signals. You are able to identify. The grace available, connecting with the testimonies in the house of God, duplicating the grace in the house of God, working the grace in the house. It must be a concern, your, your interest. You must be working hard to ensure that your spiritual life is at the point it can draw from the grace available in your environment to maximize your followership. Because followership is for inheriting the promises, it's for getting your heritage come to you. And we are saying, this is what you must do. You must be spiritual. Hallelujah. Yes. And as we do that, we must be steadfast. As a matter of fact. Steadfast, as the Bible says, the first followership that we see in the New Testament is properly documented for us to know what to do. The Bible says in the book of Acts 2, verse 42. Acts 2, 42 and 43. It says, uh, the, the early church, they talk about the, the first new believers. He said, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon all souls, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. Look, the apostles are not there with fast and grace. They are anointed. They are full of the Spirit of God. They are power packed. Even their shadows are in the dead. There's no doubt about what they carry. But how do you connect? You must be as steadfast as the members of this church. You understand me? Yes. You must be committed to the teachings that come your way in the place. Those teachings will give you a desire, interest, will open up to the promises of God. Those teachings, the doctrines available. You must be, you must believe God to have your heart open, to pay attention to what is being taught. Because in the word of God, there is revelation. Your faith maximizes at the point of revelation. Faith comes by revelation. Faith is, comes by hearing the word of God. And I will tell you, it is perfected by revelation, by an encounter with the word of God. The Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel 3 21, Psalm 1 Samuel 3 21, that and God appeared again in Shiloh, and the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. So, when you are committed to teaching, God will reveal to you his secrets. will reveal to you this kind of things you are talking about. You, so many people don't know about the power, the blessedness of followership. And some are doing it carelessly, some are doing it the wrong way, some don't even know the grace available. But when you are steadfast in following the teachings that come your way like these ones, you become a better follower, a better Christian, and a better recipient of the blessings of Jehovah God. Hallelujah. Yes. You know, in that, in, in, you know, the moment somebody has said, the moment you hear that there was steadfast in the doctrines, in the teachings, it already shows you they were humble. People were not humble and never taught. Only the humble are taught. They were humble. So humility is an, an important aspect of followership that we must always seek God to help us. The book of Matthew 11 29, the Bible says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And I want to put it, until you are meek and lowly of heart, there is no learning you will ever get. And the Bible says, you shall know, and I want to say, through learning, the truth and the truth shall make you free. Your freedom is tied to the truth that you know. 
And the truth to know is dependent on your humility. And that humility is what the Bible says, it is what draws grace, the help of God. The Bible says God will resist the, the, the proud, but he shows grace to the humble. And the meek will he teach his ways, as the Bible says. And so, if you are going to understand the ways of God, if you are going to understand the weighty matters of the kingdom, uh, kingdom of God, if you are going to walk in the promise of God, beloved, you will have to appreciate the place of being very committed and effective in whatever you are taught, including what we teach you this particular moment. Hallelujah. Very important. I believe this followership is a weighty matter in the kingdom of God. Because God is a God of patterns. And your own breakthrough is tied to a particular pattern of grace available on the earth. There's no good that we are so unique and different. My own case is different. So I don't need to follow anybody. I'm following God directly. You are on your own. If you do ever, you ever do that kind of thing. God has given you family. Just like God will say, mm -hmm. I want to have just children, but I will not get married. You're a liar. You don't have children like that. Your lineage will stop with you. There will be nothing after you. And so we are saying the same way. God is a God of pattern. There's a pattern of all these challenges people have. They are grouped into particular graces available they are. And so God leads you to a particular grace, a storehouse of, of anointing, of revelation, of power, of blessing, of particular gifts put together for each one of us. And when you begin to align yourself to that particular grace, by the lead of the Holy Ghost, stay there. When you discover and find and identify the grace that will work for you, stay there. You become a child there. You say, a servant will, uh, will go, but a child abides forever. Have you found a father on the earth? In this case, father is not about gender, because it could be a woman of God, in the one that is a constant particular grace, that is meant to take you to the height of the purpose and the plan of God on the earth. You need to identify with it, and you need to stay there, and you'll be required, because challenges are always in life, to try to dissuade you from your place of calling on assignment and grace and destiny. You must, therefore, say, once you find the home, the family, the father, to wherever you are going to, then you must stick there. That's what the Bible says. They were still fast. They were deadly committed. They were devoted to those four aspects. There was the issue of fellowship. Fellowship, followership works best for a community of people who are like-minded. How pleasant and genuine and good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You are fellowshipping. You are united in purpose. Let me show you the power of that one. When you look at the scripture that I'm trying to uh, paraphrase, Mark, uh, I mean, Psalms 33, you discover the Bible says, and God commanded a blessing, even life forever in that place. Now, I want to tell you this. When the Bible talks about the oil that fell uh, from the head of Aaron and to his tunic, down to his uh, dress, down to his feet, and God commands a blessing there, it simply tells you and me, let's see, the oil represents the Holy Spirit of God. And so every time people dwell together in fellowship, in unity in particular, there is an, a mysterious opening of the Holy Spirit to break yokes in that particular community of brethren. Yes? Yes? When you are following God, following grace in the house of God, get to hear the testimonies of others. Get to fellowship. With the rest of the family of God on the earth in that particular location, you discover by that fellowship, unity, and agreement, there's an outburst, an outflow, an outbreak of the release of miracles and wonders that are beyond any one individual faith. How can I prove this from scripture? Look at the book of Acts chapter 5, verse uh, chapter 12, right? The story of uh, Peter and the story of James. James has died, and everybody else is going to die in the same order. They now pick up the man called uh, Peter. And they want to kill him so that they scatter the other junior apostles, so to speak. And now what happens is this? Once they collect Peter and the man of God is thinking he's tired, if you ask him, and almost scared that he's not praying for himself. Then he's taking the prison and the church where Rhoda's family is gathered together for an overnight prayer meeting. And while they were doing their Kesha, God was moving. And when God has brought this man home, they are doubting. It is very instructive. Why are they doubting? Why are they saying it must be his angel, not him? They are praying like in unbelief you would want to imagine. But God is not looking at their limited faith as at that time. 
He's looking at the power of unity, of purpose, and working in love. That is the, the anointing came from the unity of their purpose to pray in love for Apostle Peter. And that is what rescued him out of the place. And so we are saying, you must be steadfast. Don't, don't, don't joke with fellowship. When they come for a meeting at church, only your absence from the nation should make you over there. There's never a far distance for, for a man who has sense of what fellowship can do for them. You know why people don't go for fellowship? They've never understood the Bible says for it. The Bible is so serious about fellowship. You need to come for midweek service. Come for overnight prayer meeting at church. Yes, deny yourself. Following has not been cheap or easy. And then go to a place, go for fellowship on time that you may be able to minister to the Lord before the Lord will minister to you, you know. And so we are saying fellowship is what makes fellowship better. And fellowship here in you includes you fellowshipping with the people you are following and fellowshipping with the brethren available. Praise be to God. Yes. Now breaking bread as it was those days was not just a, a, a religious activity. Even some people today will not understand the implication. I want to tell you here, Jesus said in the book of Matthew, I mean John 5, John 6, sorry, John chapter 6 and verse 56, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinks my blood, dwells in me, and I dwell in him. Look at it. What this simply means to me is this. Every moment we gather as a community of the children of God on the face of the earth, with the intent of particular the communion table, we are simply saying, the spirit of the commission, which is not the spirit of the devil, or the spirit of a man, is the spirit of God, who is manifesting specifics to this particular family. For maintenance, sustenance, protection, preservation, and provision of virtues and values and benefits and promises to this family. So every time we gather for communion, the spirit of the commission is allowed to flow in our midst. Because when Jesus said, He, when you take of his body and flesh, he dwells in you. And remember, when Jesus was an all-rounder, no ministry is all around. We have been called as believers for the mercy to a life of pleasing God in the sense that we demonstrate our love for God. We are lovers of God. We are people who have been taught, preach, teach. If you come at 3,000 years, by the grace of God, as we know scripture, which will not change, we'll be teaching about your commitment to please God is what commits God to our family. That God is raising a family on the earth whose agenda and its purpose is to demonstrate their love for God. That they walk in love and then they will live in dominion and blessings. That is the whole mandate of this commission, the believers with them. When you go to Winner Chapel, they will be talking about faith per se, and they are right in that aspect. When you go to RCCD, the emphasis on holiness. When you go to one kind, there's deliverance there. there there's something else everywhere else. There's no all rounder. You can only be maximum. And so we are saying the, the, the spirit that enforces, strengthens, Reveals, exposes what we as a family of the believer, faith embassy, ought to do in regard to the message of love for God is allowed or flows greatly in our midst at the point of communion table. That the Jesus we know that emphasizes, that establishes our life to walk in love for Him. So the spirit of the commission. And every other aspect of this ministry is that you may not have been explained to by the ministers. Is flows easily. Our identity, our, our life is properly exclusive into operating without pressure when we gather together for the communion table. So it is what helps us, therefore, to be effective in our, 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 you know, our followership. And so pray we also know. You must be steadfast in the teaching, in the fellowship, in the break of bread, and in prayer. This is put together, those four pillars, put together is what maximizes the fellowship and the result. Look, there was a, a release of many miracles, says when every one of those many children of God were committed to those four pillars. Prayers. This commission was born on prayer. Let me tell you, it's not a minister, or any child of God. Whatever 
gave birth to your breakthrough will depend on that particular aspect for his sustenance. We don't joke with uh, our friend of our next family. Till just retired, we'll be doing it. Any branch of this commission, you don't find prayers on Friday. The pastor slept. That's a pastor that is looking for something we don't know. Whatever we eat him, God forgive them. We don't want that to happen. So, those are certain details about this commission. That you see, what sustains this commission is in that Kesha prayer meeting. If we stop prayer for five weeks, you don't want to imagine what happened. I know. I know. So, it's a strong pillar for this commission. If God gave breakthrough for you, because you are you, you are a giver. You will sustain that breakthrough with giving. If God gave breakthrough with, 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 with prayer, you must sustain that thing. There are people who forget the fact they walked into a breakthrough and then they begin to struggle and wonder, what really happened, sir? I'm paying time. I'm giving offering. You are coming for Kesha and your breakthrough came through Kesha. It was going to be sustained by Kesha. You go breakthrough by your sacrificial layer of this thing. Maintain that life of a sacrificial this day for your sustenance. Praise be to God. That's for another time. Hallelujah. Let me get to the, the better, I mean, the, the, the other part of this particular uh, discourse. Listen to me. One of the qualities of followership that makes you effective, successful, is when you understand the vision in your part and parcel of that vision. Hello? If everybody called succeeds on the premise of divine helper, the gift of man. He is called, remember, David is called, First Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 22. The Bible says, and daily, many people came to David. I thought David can kill Goliath. If he kills Goliath, who do we not kill? He cannot be an army, the one man. So, he took people who are having all challenges and trained them, and they became helpers in the world. That mighty men of valor, committed and effective followers. So we today we are talking about leadership, we talk about followership. And we are saying, listen, for you to find your own place of greatness, you have already tapped and done all these things. You must now be part and parcel of the support staff. Jesus was going to go to heaven. And many times we want to tell the disciples, how long more do you want me to be? You what the matter? You of little faith, what's the matter here? Why was he so concerned about their faith? Partly because it is them who are his foot soldiers. The Bible says he calls 70 disciples. And before he goes to a particular town, they will go before him to demonstrate the power of God. They have anointing one, they have the word of God, they have the grace, they are imparted with grace at that time to the element they extend they require for it. And they will go, heal the sick, do all manner of this, regardless of the foot soldiers. They became they were helpers, like the one who were helping David. Must know, if you are a good follower, you must help you, God's agenda. And you must also help, remember, that through Abraham, to carry on the grace of God, the power of God. This is anointing. This I do, we also do. This is after you have died. That is why he would send them, and they will be in the same mind, and they will have the sick, they will come. Peter comes and duplicates the same grace and says, Silver and gold have I done, but such as I have, I give unto you. So he has something from Jesus. He's a son. He, the same thing with Elisha. At one point, Elisha is a son. And as we said yesterday, the, the, the greatest thing about uh, uh, I mean, followership is service. And you don't, you, for how long is not important? You came for one thing to serve. When you mature, serve. God is the one that knows when your time is due. Nobody calls themselves and knows the way. Chapter 16. I want to read a few verses of scripture there. Let's begin to finish. Let's read from verse 11. Verse 10 is better. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the, in, in the least is unjust also in the match. If you have, it builds up your own blessings. We may we know this. And God is saying, if you are not committed and faithful in somebody else calling and assignment, especially the ones you have been aligned to, 
own vision and destiny will suffer, will be a challenge, will be limited, frustrated at one point in life. That's why there are certain things as other people. You will be prayed for them and you can't break through. Why? They had opportunity to buy into that breakthrough which would have come by their commitment to help every archbishop of every religion who pray for you. Answer my prayer. There are things that answer by this covenant of faithfulness, diligence, commitment into another man's own assignment. So, your own place is tied to your growth in maturity. Undermining, I say, think that he's being kibelevele with the with the boss. He can't be the if he tina him, but they cannot succeed. Why? Because there's this is a spiritual law and principle. If you are not faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? God is the one who is the person he's talking about is himself. He said, if you're not another man's say, faithful in somebody else's history, then your own father you are not committed to cover him in his weakness. And look at what happened to Noah's sons. They didn't know the cause of followers. The one son there doesn't know. The other two understand. Why would they also laugh? When the father is being naked out of drunkenness. They know. If you don't cover the Bible doesn't tell us everything. But we know those kind of people end up in the So, beloved, you must have that kind of understanding. Support. Be committed to the vision. You, you came to tap, remember. But these are the technicalities. These are the qualities. You came to tap. You came to receive. And in your receiving, you are also giving. For the principle of it's more blessed to give than to receive, it's still operating. You are that which is another man's. Then you too, you have, you become the other man to be had. Never underestimate the place of the gift of man. And it's not just out of prayer. Father, send me help us. Father in Christ, ah, be ineffective like you are the one that God called Shako Brazanda Laba. Your own big size, if you don't have a calling, it will come. If you don't know direction in life, it will come. Many people have found direction and breakthrough and purpose in life. Yes, by that one thing, they were deadly committed to make another man succeed. Yes. They are deeply participating in the success of other men. And so, you must know, you can never be an effective and successful leader in anything if you are not, first of all, a successful follower. A successful follower adds value to the leaders that are ahead of them. A successful follower is the one that adds value, that has matured, to a point they are helping their leader, the vision bearer, to succeed in his assignment. And that's why you see the Bible way, principle, and understanding. These guys came to serve and serve one master. Joshua has never, I mean, Joshua has never told you, when will Moses die? Then I will also heard this thing. Well, that's why the Bible says we live in a perverse and a natural generation. Very funny. Parents, children will be looking for, when will daddy die? And I will collect this land. These many cars, I know their mind. I, have, I, I am afraid of the lawyer. He just opened for me. And when the lawyer was one kind in one corner, I opened up the seal of the envelope where my daddy had given him the, 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 the will, the list of what you, whoever will get what. This man is still alive here. He, he should die now. When you hear the daddy is sick, oh God, take him off, take him off, take him off. So when we learn everything, <laughs> that, is, that is perversion, that is wickedness. But the whole thing is this. The serving your father is the best thing you ever will do for yourself. Elisha came and just served. The apostles did not, in fact, they were like worried. Praise be to God. And so, beloved, it's very important that we have to get to that. And God bless you as you keep on maximizing on followership. And you grow. There are levels of followership, just like there are levels of leadership. We are all leaders at every point. You just go born again and you let somebody to Christ also. And you brought them for Bible and believers commitment classes. And, and you two are there. And then you grow to become a home cell leader, a service group leader. And you too are effective there. Until God will push you and push you to wherever you are meant to be. It may not even be ministry. 
But your commitment to support and make that ministry work as us is for your own good in whatever assignment you are called. You will also find helpers that God has put together to make your own ministry or mission or vision a success. The Lord bless you. I see great things coming out of this teaching in my life. Invite others for the same teaching we'll continue tomorrow again with the same understanding. Put it together. I want to look at, I want to look at setting the record straight for the leadership. There's a lot of misconception about leadership. There are good leaders and there are bad leaders. I want to get straight from the scriptures. Just like we had a wonderful experience with, uh, with, with, with followership. I believe that this truth will change your story on aligning to the purple will of God for your assignment and calling and you shall maximize your followership in Jesus' name. Enjoy the help of God always. This is our uh, turning point season. And I believe it's your time, your turn, your season, in your time for eternal. And Lord bless you and do you good now and always in Jesus' precious name. Amen.